some of you already have this uh, summary of a Pashendi, I'm sure. Uh, some of you have seen Pashendi before, but uh, it's of all of the encyclicals that we do on these occasions, uh, it's usually, it's the one that usually throws the most light on what's going on around us because uh, modernism, the, the church is being devastated today by neo-modernism which is a rerun of modernism. Uh, and uh, modernism is what, um, w the name given to the era that Pius X scotched in uh, Pascendi. I was saying to you that the, the devil having been beaten back from the church by Gregory the Sixteenth, Pius the Ninth, uh, he was starting to come back into the clergy. They didn't yet have in the 1880s, 1890s television, but they did have liberal newspapers. The liberals had been uh, uh, hard at work fighting the French Revolution, and there were some notorious or infamous liberal Catholics like uh, Bishop Dupontlu in France and various others, Montalembert. In other words, there were some famous Catholics, quote-unquote, who were um, cozying up to the liberal ideas of the French Revolution and trying to, like Felicity de Lamennais, trying to blend the two together. And uh, the Pius IX uh, beat them back. Uh, Pius IX said to one group of French pilgrims that came through Rome, he said, uh, it's not the enemies of the church I'm afraid of, it's liberal Catholics. Those are the ones that I'm afraid of. In other words, the enemy inside the gates. The people inside Catholicism who are trying to dilute it and water it down and adapt it to the world. Those are the ones that Pius IX said he was afraid of. Uh, he died in 1878 after the longest reign of any pope in the church. And then he was succeeded by Leo XIII, who was very clear in theory but in practice was not so smart. You do get people like that who've got all the ideas straight, but then the application of the ideas is a different thing. And uh, he was not so wise in, in his application of the ideas so that uh, the, the enemy who never, never, never gives up, uh, he prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour, uh, the devil was, through newspapers and through the whole modern world, getting to a number of priests and even a few bishops and persuading them that, you know, the church is really out of date, the church is losing it. Old Mother Church, you know, the modern world is sweeping past and leaving her behind like, you know, the tide leaves a castle behind and, and, and here the church is ranting and raving up on the battlements of this church while modern life has gone on and left her behind. Really, we've got to get the church with it. And, but we're not going to be able to deceive, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to get the, old, the oldsters to move all that easily, so we'll have to deceive them. What we'll have to do is um, keep all of the appearances but change the contents, and that's the trick of modernism. In order to make the church modern, they will keep all of the appearances, they will use all of the old words, they will use all of the um, uh, old institutions, but the, the content and substance will have been completely changed and gotten into sync with the modern world. In other words, with Protestantism, liberalism and communism. They will have... So, the trick is to keep the appearances but switch the content. Uh, so, um, this is what uh, a few brilliant priests were doing in the early, by the early 1900s. Uh, Pius X uh, became Pope in 1903 and he had been, uh, like John Paul I, uh, Cardinal of Venice, uh, the Patriarch of Venice, and there he had already come across this. The, the, Pius IX knew the 19th century inside out. He, when he became Pope, uh, the liberals laughed. They said, oh, that parish priest, he's just a parish priest. He, he doesn't know anything. So we'll run rings around him. 
but they found that he, because he was a parish priest, in fact, he knew the, whole, the church from, from ground the ground upwards. He, he'd been through all stages of the church ladder. He'd climbed steadily every single stage. And uh, as he climbed, he got to know the church, and he got to know that he, he thoroughly knew the 19th century, and he had the great advantage of being a saint. And because he was a peasant, I mean, he was from a peasant family, a very good peasant family over in the Venice area, that part of Italy, northeastern Italy. Uh, precisely because he was a peasant, he wasn't just an intellectual with good ideas. He was a man that understood on the ground how things work. And therefore, he was never fooled by the liberals. He was a saint, and he was never fooled. And therefore, the liberals found that he was more than a match for them. And uh, he waited, he became Pope in 1903. He knew that this was going on, that these, a few of these brilliant intellectuals were stewing up this stew which would destroy the church if it wasn't stopped. He waited a, a few years in order to give them a chance and to try this and that, but, but as he tells us at the beginning of his of Pashendi, it didn't work. So then, in 1907, he came out with this blockbuster. Uh, and it's big. Uh, it's the biggest of the encyclicals we'll look at, we'll have time to look at these few days, and it's the most complicated because it, it's a philosophical, it, it, it rests upon philosophy. And in order to grasp Pashendi and in order to grasp modernism, we'll have to go into philosophy. We've already done a bit of it, we sketched out a bit of it yesterday, but the problem with modern people, I mean, if, if you are agreeing, some of you, I see your heads nodding every now and again uh, when it isn't asleep, uh, uh, but I don't think I don't think you sleep. Um, the uh, when the um, what was I going to say? The when the modernists they found that the Pius X was a match for them. Uh, he I forgot now what I was going to say. Yes, you're agreeing that it was uh, you know you, you've been agreeing with this sketch. Uh, that we were making yesterday of modern people who are just on a completely different wavelength and, and, and just have heads which are completely incapable of, of understanding a Catholic head. It is a, the problem is in the head. Uh, the problem is not in the heart. A lot of these people in the, in the new church are good guys. They haven't got evil hearts, but they have got rotten heads. And that's where the problem is. Um, and most people today think that philosophy is a waste of time. And when you consider the philosophy that's taught, as it's taught in today's universities, it definitely is a waste of time because it's stupid and, and idiotic philosophy. It's false philosophy. But the true philosophy is, is the most important department of, uh, the most important natural department of knowledge. The supernatural knowledge is more important, the supernatural faith, anything supernatural is per se more important than anything natural. But on the natural level, of all departments of science, whether you take philosophy, uh, chemistry, biology, uh, any kind of science, philosophy is the most important because it holds the key to all the others. So we're going, we'll, we'll have to take a look uh, at some philosophy. But if you can, uh, and we've already been, people, it's this question of people being, their minds being unhooked from reality. The mind which God made for reality Reality comes to my mind, and my mind receives reality, and my mind is essentially designed by God to be submissive to reality. Compare the, uh, uh, the mind uh, like, a woman being Im like a woman impregnated by a man. The mind is impregnated by the object, and the result is knowledge. A woman is impregnated by a man, the result is a baby. The mind is impregnated by the object, and the result is knowledge. That's a comparison. Uh, the, in other words, the object is active, and the mind is passive. That's common sense. I don't pretend that my mind is dominating the object, if I've got a grain of common sense. But modern philosophies will see it's the other way around. We'll see how and why in a few moments. And the key to this question is then, uh, philosophy. There should be one spare somewhere, unless I've left it in the machine. Is there one spare? No. No, then I've left it in the machine. It's upstairs. Doesn't matter. Um, uh, take a look. You've got uh, front and back. On one side it says one Pashendi overview. On the other side it says two Pashendi, the heart of the matter, right? 
Um, how it works is like this. Pashendi is in five sections. Look at Pashendi, one Pashendi overview. It's in five grand sections. You've got an introduction, which is paragraphs one to four, or sections one to four. You've then got section part one, which is doctrine, which goes from six to 39. You've then got part two, causes, 40 to 43. Part three, remedies, 44 to 56. And conclusion, very briefly, 57. Uh, you can guess from that, just looking at the figures, that the heavy weight of Pashendi is in uh, the doctrine, running from 6 to 39. That is the heavy weight. Of the then the causes is just 40 to 43, that's four little sections. Um, it's like a little appendix on the doctrine. And then the remedies are, are important and interesting, but uh, they, they're not at all complicated. Uh, and then the conclusion is just a single paragraph. So the, the, the center of gravity is obviously, once more, the doctrinal section. The popes go for doctrine. Why do the popes go for doctrine? Doccio, docere, doctrina because our Lord said them, Euntes doceti omnes nationis, go and teach all nations. And doctrine is teaching. So doctrine is what our Lord told his apostles to do. And the prime function of, of one of the, the, the prime, a prime function of priests is to teach. They are meant to be teachers and woe unto them if they don't teach. Um, Just have a question, doctrine, Dogma. Uh, that's uh, dogma is comes from the is is the Greek word actually. It's not docio docere in Latin. Uh, dogma is a defined part of truth. So you could say that, so to speak, doctrine. Uh, in answer to your question, doctrine uh, divides into defined and undefined but nevertheless true, because there were plenty of defined doctrines that were once undefined. So a definition makes a truth move from the undefined part of truth to the defined part of truth. The, defined, the definition doesn't make it true, it simply adds to the certainty of its being true, that's all. And the defined doctrine equals dogma. So dogma is defined doctrine, can be defined, uh, defined as defined doctrine, okay? Right. Um, then, <coughs> the, we look, uh, zero in then on part one, which is doctrine. And there you see it, uh, you see seven little figures uh, on the first side, Pashendi overview. You see modernist one, philosopher, two, believer, three, theologian, four, historian, five, critic, six, apologist, seven, reformer. Okay. So, the Pope is taking all departments of Catholic teaching and analyzing what modernism does to each of these parts of Catholic teaching one after another. So he starts with the philosopher, goes on to the believer, goes on to the theologian, goes on to the historian and the critic, finally the apologist and the reformer, and then 39, you've got a grand conclusion of all of this analysis of the modernist doctrine, and that is that modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. It's the meeting place, the composition, the combination of all possible heresies run together. And these comparisons is like a main sewer. Each heresy is a sewer collecting the filth out of people's minds, and modernism is the main sewer collecting all the filth from all filthy minds. So, Pashendi stinks, all right? The, the mo modernism stinks. It's bad news. Modernism is bad news. Uh, the, uh, it's the Pope's own comparison, I think, that is like a main sewer. It's, it's a vivid comparison. All right. Notice then, you've got the modernist, the, the first three sections are the philosopher, the believer, and the theologian. And there you've got a uh, bracket around it, and, if you, and it says the heart of the matter, see over. So when you flip over, uh, to Pashendi, the heart of the matter, you see the long and detailed analysis of the one, two, three of doctrine. So you've got 
the philosopher, the believer, and theologian on side two, and then for the historian, critic, apologist, and reformer, you come back to side one again. I think you see how the two sides of the sheet fit together. Uh, it's very clear then that the that, that, that the problem of modernism is a problem of philosophy, belief, and theology in that order. So, let's look briefly at his introduction. We popes must guard the flock and feed, guard the faith and feed the flock. Pasco pascendi, that's the Latin for to feed. We get from it, pastor is a man who feeds. A pastor is a giver of food. And a pasture is where the cattle get food. So, Pasco Pascheri is to feed, and uh, the feeding of the flock with good doctrine is the business of the Pope. Uh, especially today, he says, because the enemy is within, and the enemy within is the most dangerous. Have all of you yet got copies of Pascendi? If not, we'll uh, organize it immediately afterwards. Do read it. It's tough, but it's very well worth reading. Uh, especially, the enemy is within. Three, he paints a portrait of, these, of this enemy within, intimate. He's right in the, in the entrails of the church. He's in the guts of the church, radical. They're completely extremist. They're disguised because they know that they won't be able to sell their goods if they come out in the open with it to Catholics. Audacious. They shrink from nothing. They're perfectly willing to say two and two is five. No problem. They will shrink from nothing. Outwardly correct. Once again, the appearances are all still there. Um, but they're disobedient inside. So you've got this hypocrisy. They're hypocrites. Uh, and they're very dangerous because they are outwardly correct uh, and because they are disguised. And the, uh, the, the, the Pope says they're right in the very guts of the church. They're, they're, they're priests, they're editing magazines, uh, they're theologians, they're, they're, they're people right in the dangerous spots, just like a disease in the most dangerous spot parts of the body. That's what he says about the modernists. He says, leniency has proved ineffective. I've tried the soft touch, and it hasn't worked. So now it's the rod. Now he's, he's, he chastises them. We must strip off the modernists' mask. What does that remind you of? Of course, Leo XIII about the Freemasons. Bishops tear off the mask from Freemasonry and show it up for what it is. And he says we must strip the mask. Pius X, we've got, we've got to strip the mask off these modernists. And so he presents, and that's why the introduction, of course, always says why he's writing this or that encyclical. He, this is why he's writing Pascendi, um, which will lay out in three big parts. Firstly, the teaching or doctrine, 6 to 39. Secondly, the causes, 40 to 43. And then finally, the remedies, 44 to 56. Very clear, very simple plan. And so we, move, we go into the question of doctrine. Notice then how causes and remedies spin off from the doctrine. Notice how the historian, critic, apologist, and reformer spin off from the philosopher, believer, and theologian. And if you turn over then to Pascendi, the heart of the matter, notice how the believer and the theologian follow from the philosopher. Modernism is primarily a philosophical problem. It's a problem of mind rot. People can't think or, or their, their thinking is completely, completely and radically false. So it's a problem of the very structure of people's minds, the very way people's minds work. And Tony, Tony Rorick was saying yesterday, I'm sure it's the experience of many of you, talking to people around you today, th this disconnection from the object is how most people's minds today work. They're living in a fantasy world. It's the sound of music and Walt Disney all day long. They're just, they're just not living in the real world because their minds are unhooked from the real world. And you try to talk reality to them, and they just don't know what you're talking about. Is this the experience of more than one of you? Surely, yes. Yeah. Well, this, this is the explanation. This is the, the one document that best explains this incredible situation. The result of Pascendi was that the modernists squealed. But they, they, they'd been hit, Pius landed right on target. So all that the modernists could do was to go underground. So they, they scuttered underground. 
So he's like smashed the snake, but it just skipped back into the grass again. And it lay low. So apparently there was no problem. Which is why if you look at certain church manuals of the 1920s and 1930s, these manuals will say, oh, Pope, he made a, an encyclical about modernism, which was, which was not, which has not been a problem, which is, you know, which is a problem, which is a non-problem, which is a non-problem. But what happened, of course, was the snake went underground and just lay there waiting and moving and, and, and waiting for its time. And the popes continued in line with Pius the X for another 50 years, from 1907 to 1958, I said yesterday. But by 1958, the popes had had enough of resisting the modern world, and so, for exactly the same reasons that we've seen all along, namely, the pressure of the modern world upon the shrinking church, for exactly the same reasons that, that the modernists invented modernism, the, uh, the, that there were newspapers and television, too many priests, too many bishops, too many cardinals, reading too many newspapers and saying too, little, saying too few prayers. The, my, the world got to them, and so they're all looking for a way to go on pretending to be Catholic while they hitch up their skirts and dance with the world and the way is given to them by modernism and so exactly the same causes that gave rise to modernism in the 1900s gave rise to neo-modernism in the 1950s and when the pope got the, the bishops got tired of electing popes who would stand up to the world they wanted the cardinals wanted a pope who would who would follow the world and make life a lot easier and more pleasant for them and so they elected john the 23rd and, uh, and John XXIII began the process of letting this get inside the church. And Archbishop de Fay was very severe on John XXIII. He said that uh, in those days running up to the council and in the, first, uh, the early days of the council, there were frequently head-on clashes between the liberals and the conservatives, or we would call them today the traditionalists. And the Arch Archbishop de Fay says that the decision again and again was taken by the Pope Pope good, quote unquote, quote unquote, the heaviest quotes unquote you ever saw in your life, good Pope John went again, sided again and again with the liberals, and the result was that the liberals ran away with the council. And then Pope Paul VI was put in place by the same cardinals, another delinquent, sono tutti delinquenti. And uh, he carried on the, the terrible neo-modernist work of the, of the council and, is, and firmly established neo-modernism in, neo -modernism inside the church. And that's what we've had ever since. Uh, John the 23rd, Paul VI, is, is it possible that when they, were, they went to seminary and then as they went through seminary they were ordained? And yes. They were, they were already starting to get probably mentally indoctrinated. Oh, yes. It wasn't like a, maybe a pilot of Giuseppe Sarto who maybe was trained prior to the infestation. And so their minds might have already been infested as they were being well, raised. De yeah, yeah. Yes. Definitely John the Twenty Third was had liberal tendencies from a long way back. And, you know, I mean, I mean he was... He was in his 80s in the 1960s, so when would he have born? About 1880. 1880, he will have gone to seminary in the 1890s and 1900s when, the moder when modernism was running around. And what it amounts to is, you know, the modern world is full of liberalism and Protestantism. Masonry uh, and Protestantism is full of it. And this is all the time beating at the church and eroding the church. And the churchmen need a very strong faith to stand up to it and to tell it, go chump in the lake. Because, I mean, you know that you need a strong faith in order to resist the world which is around us today. As it's, it's, it's getting at you all the time. And uh, it takes, you know, a strong whiskey to beat these bugs down. Uh, otherwise, the bugs take over, so... On the 23rd, was, <coughs> when he was a seminary professor, wasn't he fired from his Yes. He, John, the 20, John the 23rd was fired from teaching at the Lateran, I think, yes. Before modernist tendencies. And when he became pope, he delighted to go over to the drawer and he looked at, huh, look, I was sacked for modernism and now I'm pope. Ho, 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 ho. Yeah? That was his attitude. 
But there's some interesting articles being coming out in Italian, a close study in Italian of John the 23rd's origins and background. The man was a liberal from the word go, but he lay low. And he was a soft touch and he was a good guy, quote unquote, so he slid his way up the ladder until the delinquents who wanted a worldly pope put him in. Um, he, John the 23rd was not a good pope. And it's very possible that he did actually join Freemasonry or the Rosicrucians. Yes, very possible, yes, in Turkey, very possible. Yeah, um, he wasn't a good guy at all, but he looked like it. He made everybody think he was, and the media loved him. If the media loved them, you can be quite sure there's something seriously wrong. Uh, but the myth, John, the good Pope John is an absolute myth. The man was a crook, basically. A crook, a real crook. I think that's, that's what's coming out. I heard the same thing said in Italy uh, in January at the Sisi Nono Congress in Albano. Uh, serious evidence that John the 23rd was into masonry, was a mason. Serious evidence. So, you, the man was a crook. Uh, and, and he let, with one decision after another, he quite deliberately handed the church over to neo-modernism. And Paul VI continued on the same line. As for Paul VI, he never did a proper seminary. He was a weak child and not in good health. Very good mind, I mean a very clever mind, but he did his studies at home and therefore he never did proper seminary studies. And that, that is... Uh, uh, so, let's... We need then to zero in on the philosopher because the modern philosophy is the ultimate Declaration of Independence. It's the ultimate revolution. I am revolting against any object imposing itself upon me. I am going to free liberate myself from having to say that that is brown. If I want to say it's blue, well then it's going to be blue. If I want to say it's red, then it's going to be red. I'm the boss of what color it is. It isn't, but I am. As you can see, it's filled with pride. It's this, this liberation from the world of God and replacing it with my world. Putting me in the place of God, putting man in the place of God. That is always, as one of the popes said, I think it was Leo XXI Leo or Pius XI, I forget, one of them says in one of his cycles, the bottom line is man replacing God. That's the modern world. We zero in on philosophy. Look at philosophy, we, we see six and seven, you've got several lines for six, just two paragraphs. Uh, called principles, and then you've got 7b to 13 is application. So there again, if, you, if we look at the philosopher, if we assume that the causes and remedies follow from the doctrine, if we assume that the uh, believer, theologian, historian, critic, apologist, and reformer follow from the philosopher, we zero in on the philosophy, and we notice then that again, the, it's a question of principles and application. And the application obviously follows from the principles. So we zero in once more, we're zooming in all the time, closer and closer, we zoom in on six and seven. We see that these principles are negative and positive. Negative, I've called it their phenomenism and agnosticism, and positive is called vital imminence. And the truth about the, this great encyclical is that if you once understand six and seven, if you once understand those two sections, you've got the whole thing. The rest just follows like, uh, you know, if you, it's like, they, like all the dimes running out of the slot machine if you hit the jackpot. So if you can hit the jackpot with six and seven, you can understand the rest of it without very great difficulty. But six and seven take a bit of understanding. Uh, notice again, amongst these principles, the, 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 the six is negative and seven is positive. And what that is, is like the clearing of the building site, the destroying of anything on the building site, that's negative, and then what you build in the place of what you destroyed, and that's positive. So the phenomenism, agnosticism, is the clearing of the building site. And we can imagine that it's going to do away with all the faith previously that was ever said. And then vital imminence is how we're going to rebuild in the place of what we've destroyed. So since clearing the building site precedes putting up the new building, then if we're looking at principles, we want to look at the negative principles first. So we're going to zero in on uh, section six. There you've got 
Beyond the phenomena, things appearing as they appear, all is unknowable in capital letters and double underlined. But God, author of nature, miracles as such, and external revelation are all beyond the phenomena. Therefore, therefore God, uh, God, miracles, and revelation don't exist without or come from without. All right, let's, that, that first sentence, double underlined and in capital letters, is the key to the whole encyclical. <coughs> And this is where we have to get into a little philosophy. Let's, uh, let's look then at uh, modern philosophy. For a long time, the uh, Western civilization uh, was taught by the church. Mother Church created Western civilization, and Western civilization took her philosophy from Mother Church. The philosophy of Mother Church is uh, Aristotle. Uh, for centuries, centu well, for at least from Thomas Aquinas onwards, uh, from Thomas Aquinas to Descartes, that's, let's say, from about 1250 to 1650, that's 400 years, it was Aristotle. And Aristotle is the great master of philosophy. Uh, prior to Aristotle, it was rather Plato, uh, who is more, uh, more lush, but Aristotle is more correct. Aristotle is very dry, Ar Ar Plato is very lush, but Aristotle corrected Plato on several points. And so Plato was fine as long as people didn't go into it too close. But when the Arabs began messing up the European mind in the 1200s, then the church had to fall back on Aristotle. It had to straighten out Plato with Aristotle, and Aristotle was the, uh, the church's mind, and Aristotle was the basis of modern science, modern medicine, modern biology, you name it, and it goes back to Aristotle. So, uh, Aristotle is common sense. Aristotle is completely in line with common sense. Uh, if I see a yellow wall, well, that's a yellow wall. Funny you should have to come all the way across to Minnesota in order to be told that a yellow wall is a yellow wall. But uh, the pro pro problem is that the modern world is off the yellow wall. For the modern world, that isn't a yellow wall, that's a transcendental experience of cats or something. Uh, so you, you come to Winona in order to get your common sense fortified. And uh, Pashendi is the uh, fortification of common sense. But common sense is exactly what today is being undermined. You put women and men together on ships and then you, you send them out on the ocean and you seriously expect them not to get up to what men and women get up to. Uh, common sense, people are just simply losing their common sense. All right, now, uh, the philosophy, uh, the, 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 we're into the question the, uh, of knowledge. Knowledge is actually a very mysterious thing. I can look at this book and say, well, I know that's a book. It's common sense that I know that it's a book. And I, and I handle it, I touch it, I feel it, I hear it, I read it. No big deal. If I, if I, knowledge is not a problem unless I begin, begin studying it. But the more I study knowledge, the more mysterious it is. Uh, and we can't go into it a, a great deal of it, but let's just say, uh, the, for the moment that knowledge with human beings, knowledge, as Aristotle says, knowledge is a combination of intellection and sensation. Now there's the mind and the senses. Uh, you're listening to me uh, and the, I'm beating out on your, your eardrums, your senses are picking up words and while your senses, your, your, your ears are picking up words, the mind is deciphering the meaning of those words. If you heard absolutely nothing, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. Because if I, unless I send something out for the sensation, the intellect can't do anything. And that's, that's the... Uh, therefore, for knowledge, according to the church, according to Aristotle, according to common sense, we need both the intellect and the senses to work. Therefore, knowledge equals... Intellection and sensation. Now, intellection is not a word that you normally meet, but it's very clear what it means. It's the activity of the intellect, just as sensation is the activity of the senses. 
F let me give you an example. This is a, a, lovely, a, a lovely example I like. Um, those of you that have seen this before, don't give it away. But those of you that haven't seen this before, what is this? Anyone know what that is? Don't give it away, those of you who have known it. Swiss cheese. See, okay, look. The point is that your senses are already t feeding you all the information the senses need. But you don't, the, the mind is, is playing on the sense material, and the mind can't yet, most minds don't, can't yet decipher it. Well, I tell you, it's a giraffe walking past a window. Ah, of course. <laughs> See? It's a giraffe walking past a window. Then the mind kicks in. So that's a classic example of the sense material being interpreted by the mind, right? So uh, you, are, you have a lot of those tricks. You know, in, in, in boys, school boys magazines, they have a number of those sort of tricks. But that what the tricks tell us is that, that, that for me to know that that is a, a giraffe walking past the window, I need the sensation, the, the blue spots and the blue lines, and then the, 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 the thinking. So it's, it's a combination of the two. Therefore, knowledge for us human beings is a combination of intellection and sensation. That, if you, if you try to analyze how the mind and the senses work together, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. That is the whole uh, Aristotelian theory of knowledge. And, but it, it corresponds to common sense. Well, now, the moderns, uh, Aristotle said that he didn't want... Uh, Descartes was fed up with Aristotle. Descartes was, going to, was a brilliant Frenchman, a mathematician. Um, he would have been very good with computers. Uh, he had that kind of mind. Um, he, uh, he said, I'm going to start a new way. And so, and he is the beginning of um, the, modern, the modern mind disconnecting itself from reality. He is the, one of the most important. So what Descartes did, Descartes said, what Descartes did was to cut the anchor in, the sen in sensation. I said to you yesterday, for instance, Descartes argues, I can dream that I'm being eaten by a monster. My senses are telling me that I'm being eaten by a monster. Then I wake up and I realize that my senses were completely false. Or I put a stick in water and the stick looks bent and I know that my senses are not telling the truth. Uh, therefore, the sensation is unreliable. Therefore, we must, uh, knowledge is intellect alone. Intellect alone. And no sensation. Descartes despises sensation, and he's going to, so to speak, like many modern philosophers, he's the first of the modern philosophers who's going to close his eyes and close his ears. This is what I think the world is, and it's got, I don't care what my senses tell me, I'm not interested in what my senses tell me, I am going to dream up the world from inside my own head. That's Descartes. Um, so, uh, try it. I know reality because it's all inside my head. Try it for size. It's not very pleasant. Um, the, there was an Englishman who reacted against this. I'm, uh, this is a very, David Hume, this is a very, 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 uh, very short uh, summary of modern philosophy to explain how we can arrive at the insanity of this system. Because to, uh, David Hume says, he's an English, he's a Scotsman actually, and you know that the Scots love animals. I mean, the, the British love animals. So, um, they love dogs and they love animals. So, you can imagine the British don't like the idea that it's just all brain work and no sensation. So, S David Hume swings right over to the opposite extreme. He says, knowledge is sensation alone. Sensation alone. Uh, for instance, he's standing at the billiard table and he, he takes the cue and he knocks the cue ball against the red ball and he sees the, the, the cue ball stopping and the red ball starting and he says, what I see is the white ball moving, stopping, the red ball starting to move. What I do not see with my eyes is that the white ball is the cause of the red ball moving. And he's actually quite right. 
because the eyes don't see that. All that the eye picks up is white in motion stopping, red motionless starting. That's all that the eye picks up. The eye as an eye, sensation as sensation, does not pick up the reality, the, the relation of causality. It's the mind that's just like the eye doesn't pick up that that's a giraffe opposite a window. The eye doesn't pick that up. The, all that the eye picks up is one, two, three, four, five, six blue lines, and then about seven or eight little blue circles. That's all that the eye picks up. The, all that the eye picks up is color. Therefore, strictly, Hume is right. But you see, what he's saying is instead of saying that that knowledge is something more than just sensation, he, he wipes, he, he, he just destroys, says, I don't see causality. All that, I, all that I pick up from outside me is by my senses. My senses don't pick up causality, therefore there's no such thing as causality. That's Hume. And so we're, this is literally a dog's world. The British philosophers put us in a dog's world. The British philosophers destroy intellection. The French philosophers destroy sensation. The German comes along and says, ach, that's no good. Uh, we must get, we must put, the, the German says, if you destroy causality, you destroy science. Uh, science automatically assumes that there are relations of causality, and if I can't pick up causality, then, I, then, then science is destroyed. But Kant has been immensely impressed by Newton. Kant correctly says there is such a thing as science. But Kant, so Kant definitely wants to defend intellect, because he says there is such a thing as science, the knowledge of universals which goes beyond just patches of color in front of my nose, or patches of sound coming on my eardrums. So he wants to defend science, and he's quite right. But he also, uh, so against Hume, he wants to put intellection back in. But Kant admits that Hume is quite right, that sensation doesn't pick up universals. Sensation doesn't pick up science. Science is not in sensation. Uh, the, 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 the sensation is all that I pick up from outside. So Kant says, get, get, get this clear, Kant says, uh, sensation is all that I get from outside, but there is such a thing as intellection and there is such a thing as science. But the intellection and the science don't come from outside because Hume is right, all that come, comes from outside is sensation. So he agrees with the Frenchman, or he agrees with the English, the Britishman, the Britisher. He agrees with the, the Scott Hume that all that I get from the outside is sensations. But he agrees with Descartes that there is such a thing as science. So how is he going to fit together science and there's only sensations? How he does it is the following way. He says, you're going to meet now Frankenstein, who's a character well known to seminarians. Frankenstein is an, an, a tree. Uh, Kant will say, the tree provides me with sensations. The tree gives me sensations. These are sensations. And the sensations, the, the, the sensations arrive in my senses, which transmit through to the brain. But once they're inside, it's my intellect my mind that creates the universal, that creates the science. So Kant stands at the edge of the billiard table. Hume is quite right that the mind can't pick up causality from outside. All that comes from outside is patches of color. It's my mind that is saying that the white ball is the cause of the red ball moving. In other words, my mind creates what the 
sensations really are all about. Now, when I put the giraffe on the board, the mind was not creating the giraffe. The mind was recognizing the giraffe inside the sensations. And, and, and to straighten out this problem uh, swiftly without going too much into it, let's give, let's give you now, let's give us now, how does Aristotle solve this problem of, a serious problem, of the sensations only picking up little particulars and yet the mind picking up universals like causality. How does that happen? How can I uh, burn hydrogen on Monday morning, burn hydrogen on Tuesday morning and it turns into water, burn hydrogen on Wednesday morning and it turns into water. I have a particular sense experience of the water on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. How can the mind say that that is a law which applies to all hydrogen burning anywhere and everywhere? The senses can't pick it up because the senses can only pick up water on Monday, water on Tuesday, water on Wednesday. How does the mind know that this is a question of water, that hydrogen and oxygen will combine to make water all over the world in all times? The senses can't do it. How does the mind know it? Modern scientists say they don't know it. You just assume it. They cheat. They pretend they don't know it because they don't want to have to solve that problem. Aristotle says we do perfectly well know it. And Aristotle's, uh, Kant says we do know it. Kant says it's the mind that's making out of water, or out of all water, oxygen and hydrogen. But Aristotle, Aristotle does it this way. It's, it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, here's the tree, and here's Aristotle. Or here's our viewer. He's even uglier than Frankenstein. Uh, but um, Aristotle says that every uh, every real thing, every, especially material thing, has a, an, a form which makes it what it is. And that form is intelligible and the, the appearances are sensible. Obviously the appearances are sensible. The appearance of this little, little book is a purple which I pick up with my eyes. So the appearance, the Aristotle says, while the appearances are picked up by the eye, down the channel of the appearances comes the treasure of the form which is picked up by the intellect. So, the, the phenomena, that's the, the phenomena of the object, the appearances, that's the Greek word, a phenomena is simply the Greek word for the appearances, things appearing, phenomena. The appearances of the object, like its, its texture, its color, everything that I can pick up with my five senses, the taste if I wanted to try tasting it, the phenomena are the sense appearances. The sense appearances are picked up by the senses, notably the eye, uh, the eye obviously, but also by the ear. So the, the, the sense appearances come into my senses, but d down the middle of the sense appearances is coming the essence of the object, which the intellect picks up. Comparison. Imagine a slave carrying a box to the queen out of which she, which she unlocks and gets out the treasure. The slave, this is a comparison to tell us what's happening. The slave is incapable of getting inside the box. The slave is carrying the treasure, but the box is locked and he can't get inside it. So as far as the slave is concerned, there isn't any treasure. All he gets at is the box. So the, 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 uh, the senses is the slave. The sensation, the senses and the sensations, are carrying the, the box. The senses are carrying the phenomena, the appearances. They're carrying the appearances to the mind, which is the queen, who unlocks the essence, which is behind the appearances. 
Is this remotely clear? <laughs> uh, it's difficult. But uh, if you get into the problem of knowledge, it is quite a difficult problem to explain how I can see with my senses only particular things, and yet the mind can pick up universals. How can the mind pick up universals from just individual sensations? And the answer is because the individual sensations are carrying inside them something universal. The sensation and the senses can't pick up what's universal. There's no way that a dog can intellige or think meat. The dog simply <laughs> meat. He has senses of the meat. But the meaning of meat, the thought about meat, the nature of meat, the essence of meat, the think, the thinkness of meat, <laughs> he's got no faculty to pick that up. So the dog just eats the meat. On the other hand, the man standing beside the dog watches the meat, thinks about the meat. Is the meat healthy? Is it unhealthy? Is it, uh, is it enough? Is it too little? Is it, is it, uh, where does it come from? Is it sheep or is it dog? He, he's thinking about it. The dog can't think. The human being can think, the dog can't think. Therefore, the sensations come to the dog like they come to the human being, but the human being has another faculty which can unlock and open the sensations and get at the treasure inside, the intelligible treasure inside. The dog has no faculty to unlock and get inside the sensations, and therefore the dog can't uh, understand, can't begin to think about the essence. All right, now you see the difference between Aristotle, briefly, and Kant. For Kant, the, it's the, we'll change color here. I, uh, for Kant, all that the ob outside object provides and can provide is sensations. The, it's the mind that makes laws and essences and things out of those sensations. It's my mind that creates universality. So for Kant, these sensations are objective, but the essence behind the sensations, what's really going on behind the sensations, is, is up to me. So I can look at the sensations of what's normally a tree, and I can say that that's a, uh, that's a lamppost. My mind is capable of saying that that's a lamppost. Because my mind is not determined by the sensations. You remember, here, the form imposes itself upon the intellect. The intellect is passive, and the form is active. And I was saying to you, like the, the male principle fertilizes the female principle, so the object fertilizes the mind and produces knowledge. And the active principle is the object, and I am passive. Well, Kant doesn't like that. So uh, you can see that on Kant's system, it's getting a little... On Kant's system, it's the, the, there are the sensations. I've received the sensations, the phenomena have come to me, but now it's my mind which is active. I tell the object what it is. The object, the intelligible object, is not imposing itself upon me. The phenomena are imposing themselves upon me, but then my mind is imposing upon the phenomena what they are. And my mind is giving to the phenomena their universality. The mind is universal, the sensations are particular, and my mind is giving to the sensations their universality. Therefore, science is possible. Hume is right, we don't know anything beyond the sensations. But science is possible because my mind is telling the sensations what universals they are. Therefore, I am the creator of the intelligible world. Uh, and says, just to finish with Kant, as for the what's behind the phenomena, Kant, like Hume, says, we don't know. Just one big question mark. And he calls that the ding and zich, the thing in itself. And he says, we don't know what the thing in, thing in itself is. What do you think the successors of Kant in the same line said? 
Can anybody see, imagine what Kant says? What the thing is in itself, we don't know. What do you think the successors of Kant said? Exactly. They said, and then how do you know that there even is a thing behind the phenomenon? So this is like the smile of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. There's still the smile, but the cat's disappearing. Uh, and eventually the smile will disappear as well. And so, the, as you can see, by this system, which in theory is, res after the stupid David Hume, is restoring the possibility of science, but it's restoring the possibility of science not in Aristotle's sane way, which Descartes cut loose from, but in a completely new and completely insane way, so that while the senses are still attached to reality, the mind is completely unhooked from reality. And, as I say, originally Kant's justification was to save universal science. But the truth of the matter is that his system makes my mind the king of creation, which is what he, which is what, which was what, and it's Kant who let loose the whole modern madness, who paved the way for the modern madness. Isn't that the basis for virtual reality? Uh, could be, could be. Um, yes, you see, I mean, virtual reality, you, you wrap your head around with some kind of machine, don't you? And then what you pick up on this machine is as good as the real thing out there, correct? It's, 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 along, the, it's along the same lines, yes. It's along the same lines. Uh, any, any other questions there for the moment? If my mind tells me that that's a lamp instead of a tree, <laughs> yes. and then I can't turn a light on, why don't I change my mind? Because I am the king of creation. But that's stupid. I can't get <laughs> Modern philosophy and the modern world are stupid. <laughs> but, as you know, um, but I am the king of creation on this basis. Uh, somebody, I think, once said to the German philosopher Hegel, supposing some little dog bites your heel, exactly this problem. He said, too bad for the dog. <laughs> In other words, if I, get a wha if I get out of whack reality, that's reality's problem and not my problem. And that's how these people think. And remember, of course, that they are selective. When they come down to breakfast in the morning, they, 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 their mind tells them that that is coffee. Otherwise, they'd get mighty thirsty. Why was there uh, uh, enough <coughs> intelligent, intelligent people to shoot down all these nuts? I just, I, I never could understand why these people had so many people bow down to them and they become the course of the survey, course in philosophy. Only them. I never could understand that. You've got too much common sense to understand it. God bless you. The answer is that this began amongst a few philosophers in, in, in Germany. But you see, the great thing is that this system, one, saves science, Two, save sensation. It looks as though it's putting together knowledge into intellection and sensation again. Kant has a place for both of them. So it looks as though he's, he's more sane than, than Descartes, and it looks as though he's more sane than Hume. But of course, the way in which he puts them together again is completely insane, compared with what, uh, where, where Aristotle does it. Here, the, object the intelligible object imposes itself upon my intelligence. But now, uh, how, do, how did this system get away? Well, it started small. And you see, when somebody reads Kant, he says, he's got any common sense. Hey, that's, no, nah, that's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. But, mm, makes me into God. Mm, I like that. I become God. I make the object. I am the king of the object. So pride is the, is the reason why people buy into this system. They'd, and pride and the fact that they no longer want, and this is the modern world. The modern world does not want to submit to God. And it does not want to submit to God's reality. It wants to remake reality. And therefore, an insane, a Luciferian ambition is behind the acceptance of this, of this nonsense. And the modern world, you know, I mean, over centuries, it's been happening over centuries, and uh, 
you, if you apply this system, if you apply this system logically, we were saying yesterday, I think, if you apply this system logically, you'll go crazy. You won't be able to survive. But if you apply it selectively, then you will apply it, you, you will not apply the system when you need to recognize reality in order to survive, like if that's coffee on the table and my car, I crank my car by cranking the crank and not by cranking the trafficator, right? So I, I apply reality, I apply Aristotle enough to survive, but then when I get into my study and I want to write philosophy in order to make myself into a famous professor, I do this because I know that in the modern world this system appeals rather more than that. People want folly. And if you can't understand people wanting folly, God bless you. Congratulations. I just, I just seems like somebody would have had his head on straight to, look, the emperor has no clothes. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the Catholic priests, the Catholic church said this is nonsense. Uh, Kant went on the index. Of course you had Catholic intellectuals, the D Dominicans especially, of course. Catholic intellectuals read all of this stuff and right from the word go said it's nonsense and those books went on to the index at a, at, a, at a rate of knots. But people in the modern world don't listen to the Catholic Church. Oh, no, 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 the Dominicans rejected this. Oh, yeah. Except the modern Dominicans. Oh, now you go to any Catholic, univer Catholic seminary, Catholic university, and all of the youngsters learn Kant. Okay. 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 There's the reality of the matter. Yes, it was 40 years ago. The Dominicans here were already gone, but that's into the well, into, quite well into the modern age. So that's prior to Vatican II. It was a hotbed of modernism. Prior to Vatican II, it was a hotbed of modernism. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. How do people buy into fantasy and criminal stupidity? Answer: Because it suits them. Because they become God. And it also suits, it also, I also kick free of the Ten Commandments. Ah, now. Now they turn into the Ten Suggestions. I'm no, I'm no longer tied down by that commandment and that commandment. Ah. Yeah, fact, There's a gleam in my eye. You, I, it's as simple as that. In the same area, a Dominican and a diocesan priest got into an argument on abortion. And this was 1959. Yes. Yes. The Dominicans. The Dominicans went bad, and when the Dominicans went bad, the fish rots by from the head, says the old proverb. And the Dominicans were the thinkers of the church. And the rotting of the Dominicans and the rotting of the Jesuits was pretty important in, in the church. But they went bad, and they went really bad. If the Dominicans and the Jesuits had, had stayed straight, the church might have held. But, but the devil made sure that he would get to the Dominicans and the Jesuits. And he does it by various ways. Weakness of the flesh, that was Luther. And then I changed the laws in order to suit my weakness. That's one serious reason. Bribes, laziness. So, um, Pius X, uh, take a look at, at the causes. Let's jump to right now to 40, 41, 42, 43. And you see the moral causes are curiosity and pride. The, the, the desire for something new. The desire for novelty, that's another serious reason why people... We've, we've had Aristotle for centuries and centuries. It's all old hat. We all know we can, we can recite Aristotle in our sleep. Let's have something new, for goodness sakes. So the love of something new. Curiosity and then pride. Modernists are self-assured, presumptuous, disobedient and disrespectful. They're gods. On their system, they are God. That certainly suits their flight. And then the intellectual re reason is ignorance. 41, the ignorance of scholasticism falls prey to the false glamour of modern philosophy. Modern philosophy has got a false glamour. It is glamorous. It's slick. It's packaged in a beautiful cellophane package. And it's presented as the future. It's presented as, you know? Is that, an, is that the beginning of an answer? That should, that, that should be the answer to that question. People don't, to be sensible, it's too dull, it's too old-fashioned, and it's too restricting. Whereas this system gives me complete liberty. This is the ultimate of liberty. I am free from any commandment, and I'm free from any knowledge that I don't like. I just rearrange my mind playing on the sensations. Really, even the apple all over. Yes. 
Exactly. It's as simple as that. Yes. Yes. Uh, David. I mean, would part of the problem have been that this grew up in the Protestant areas and their need to reject the Catholic Church means a need to reject, uh, reject Thomism? Yes. Implicitly rejecting Aristotelian philosophy. And Plato's answer on, on the issue of essence is not satisfactory. Yes, that's right. And so they were essentially left with nothing else to choose from. Yes. Because to accept Aristotle would be ultimately to accept Thomism. Yes, that's and you right. can't do that because that's the Kant. Yes, thing. Kant was from Protestant Germany, from the northeast, from Königsberg. I think he had a Scottish Presbyterian mother, so Protestantism is deep behind Kant. Protestantism, rationalism, liberalism—they're all the same, the same stable. Let's break there, and we'll pick up again at, let's say, eleven o'clock. There's no problem. Eleven o'clock.